I'm going to talk about transperineal biopsy, but it's going to be from a different perspective, not from a perspective of which is better to do a, a biopsy, transrectal or transperineal, or which is safer, but why we'd want to med maybe consider for other reasons to do a transperineal biopsy. Those are my disclosures. Um, as Dr. Garwood said, we do about 1.2 million biopsies a year, and the majority of them had, are still trust. The last reported literature showed about 5% were transperineal, but as we know, this has been increasing, and I suspect we're going to start seeing this is closer to the 10 to 15% range. Classically, we treat the whole gland when we have to uh, deal with a patient with localized prostate cancer, and it's either uh, some form of uh, extirpation, that's removal prostatectomy or external beam radiation or brachytherapy, but the long-term morbidity for both of these procedures is substantial. And if we want to apply whole gland therapy using cryo or HIFU, there may be less morbidity, but there's a, I think we recognize there's a much higher local failure rate. So whole gland extirpation is technically challenging and often not successful, success being measured by both success in uh, eradicating the cancer and not having un um, unnecessary morbidity. So focal therapy, can, can the treatment of a portion of the prostate give similar oncologic results and improve the quality of light? That's the main question now that we're addressing and trying to figure out whether or not we should be offering more focal therapy. And what we really need to determine is to how to properly identify candidates and which portions of the prostate don't require ablation. So our focus has always been, where is the cancer? Let's treat that area. But really what we should be thinking about is, where is no, there no cancer? We can leave that portion of the prostate alone and only address the portion that's going to affect uh, the patient's longevity. So think about it. Let's look where there is no cancer and maybe we could spare that. Classically, uh, we've arrived now, uh, we've uh, decided that MRI is very helpful, but as you can see in this, this data from UCLA and Cornell and Duke, if you're thinking about making a diagnosis, okay, yes, we're all agreeing there's a big help with the MRI because it, it helps focus us on whether or not the patient has clinically significant prostate cancer, but if you're looking to, turn, to use the MRI as your target, to decide where to put the focal therapy, it fails because it's not very good at finding the periphery of the lesion. And just applying a five millimeter margin to the region of interest is not going to be correct in many cases. This is a uh, radical prostatectomy whole mouse study that showed the green is the MRI identified lesion and the red is what the pathologist found on the whole mouse sections. And you can see there's potentially a lot of discordance between the two. And this paper from UCLA where they looked at the ability for MRI to identify, identify the smaller lesions. When the tumors are smaller than 0.5 centimeters and they're multifocal, MRI missed almost 90% of the cancers and clearly over one third or roughly one third of them were clinically significant. So let's talk about transperineal mapping. This is a shot I, of Dr. Scuteris in, in Greece doing the GRID approach under anesthesia. Uh, and you can see there in the monitor, he's got the needle in the prostate transperineally. And one of the important things to recognize is when you're doing a biopsy is if you want to adequately assess what's in the gland, you really need to stack the biopsies in line. So on the left, you see the biopsy goes from the apex to the middle of the gland, and then on the right, you see the biopsy goes from the middle of the gland to the base of the gland. So our biopsy devices are roughly two centimeters in size. If the biopsy, if the prostate length is longer than two, then you need uh, a to put in two needles. So you need to do inline biopsies until the day comes when we have a new needle that will actually reach from the apex to the base. This is what's why we require so many biopsies to be done. So this is a paper we published on transperineal biopsy uh, in the Journal of Urology, and what the regression line on the right shows you is the black dots represent a large number of studies published where they report the biopsy density. The biopsy density is defined 
by the number of cores you take divided by the prostate volume. So if you had a 30 cc prostate, you took 30 biopsies, your biopsy density would be one. So it turns out when you, you look at the, all the studies or many of the studies that reported biopsy density plus this study, which are the red dots, there's a very nice regression line. The R squared was 0.7, which means the data is fairly tight. And as you increase the number of biopsies you take, you increase the diagnosis of both clinically significant cancer, but you also increase the diagnosis of clinically insignificant cancer. So that's the downside of so many biopsies. Dr. Dr. Dave Crawford has uh, compared this work to his prostatectomy database and has found that the correlation, when you have a high biopsy density, to the prostatectomy sp uh, specimens are very close in terms of the accuracy of the Gleason scoring. This is a paper we recently published in British Journal of Urology, which looked at comparing the MRI, pyrads 3 to 5, to the mapping biopsy. So in this case, the biopsy density, as you see down here, was 1.6. And just like Dr. Gorin says, when you're doing all these biopsies, you turn out to have a lot of positive cores when the patients have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, and we're going to have to rethink what this really means. It's not like three cores positive out of 12 for a truss. When you're taking uh, 50 biopsies and you have 10 positive, it's the same ratio, but the implication may or may not be the same. And what we did for this study is we, put the, we made the prostate into four quadrants, and the axis was the urethra, so you have the right and left anterior and the right and left posterior, and here's an MRI showing the region of interest, and then the biopsies were done similar to where the, these green dots were, and then we looked at the relationship uh, between the location of the lesion on MRI and whether or not the, there was cancer outside of that region. And what we found was a little, a little bit disheartening, to tell you the truth. So if you can look at the entire prostate or the different quadrants, the area under the curve was really no better than 0.6. So there's like a 40% inaccuracy. Now, this is not the same as making a diagnosis. And I think we all agree that MRI helps in making a diagnosis. But you, what this is telling us is you can't rely, you should not rely on an MRI to guide your therapy if you're doing focal therapy, because you're going to miss significant cancers that are outside of the visible lesion. I know we're all excited about this because you have a target, but that target is not correct in terms of if you're going to go after um, localized prostate cancer and think about treating less than the entire gland. So I, getting to the point of how many biopsies should you take, and this is the problem because as Dr. Gorin pointed out, we really don't want to go to the OR and take 60 biopsies. It takes too long and there's morbidity. The more biopsies you take, we've published this, the more likely you're going to get urinary retention, especially in the bigger glands. But this schema is totally ina inadequate if you're going to do it transperineally because why would you just take a biopsy here and then forget about the rest of this? That's not going to get to where we want to be. And if you look at this schema, and this schema is similar to what Dr. Gorin would do with his precision point, is he'd take biopsies along here, along here, and then he would take the anteriors. Uh, and this is about 24 cores. So now we're 12 to 24. This is done in the office. And if you look at the work from uh, the University College of London, so Dr. Emberton and Dr. Ahmed's work, when they validated in their PROMISE study that the MRI is the way to go, they were doing transperineal biopsies, and they were doing the transperineal biopsies at a biopsy density of about 1.2. So they were always taking 40 biopsies per patient, uh, even though the patient had an MRI. So it wasn't a transrectal, it was a transperineal approach. So this, I'm going to show you how I model this out. This is uh, one of the SIM phantoms, and it's an MRI, and this is the region of interest that you typically may see in a patient. It's very circular because it's easy to make it this way. There's the urethra and the rectum. So going back to what I said about the bisecting, there's dividing it in right and left halves, and then you have now four quadrants, and there is a region of interest. So <clears throat> as a specialty, urology specialty and radiation oncology, 
I think it is much easier to identify a quadrant of the prostate because it's easy to know where the urethra is when you're going to go ahead and do the treatment. So why not look at this from a quadrant perspective? And then you don't need to take so many biopsies. I think most of us have agree if you take three biopsies transperineally through the region of interest, you're going to find out if there's cancer there. And if this is a region of interest uh, with a pyrads 4 or 5, it's most likely going to be positive. So that's really all you need to do there. Then you need to determine how big is this cancer. And like as I said, you can't rely on the MRI. So all you need to do then, if you're doing a quadrant basis, take six biopsies there. If those biopsies are negative, then you know everything inside that quadrant should be ablated if the region of interest is positive. So what about the rest of the prostate? So on the rest of the prostate, you have to be, posteriorly, you have to be a little bit more aggressive. So you need to really be doing biopsies like that. But on the anterior, the cancers are not that common. So you really only need to do biopsies like that. So that l ends up with six, 26 primary biopsies plus four to six inline biopsies, which is roughly 30 to 32 biopsies on average. A little bit more with a bigger prostate, but this is not difficult to do in the office. They would disagree a little bit with what Dr. Gorin said. Yes, you can use a precision point. There's another one called Surefire. But you can also do this with a grid. Dr. Jos Immersel in Amsterdam has done more than 1,000 MIM BK fusion biopsies under local anesthesia with a grid. So you don't need to eliminate the grid to do this type of biopsy. And I do think the grid has some advantage because when you're doing this sort of localization issue, it's easier to localize when you fire the needle straight versus firing it at an angle. So I now am thinking that we should be looking at the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer from this, what I call the unified approach, where you have image fusion, so you fuse the MRI to an ultrasound image, you do some form of mapping biopsy, and that remains to be discussed what's the best, but you want to be able to register the location of the biopsy sites, both positive and eventually uh, all of them in both uh, two dimensions and three dimensions with representations. You've got to be able to upload the pathology results so you can take that file in DICOM and register, register that file to a focal therapy treatment platform. This, in my mind, is the way we should be looking at how we manage our prostate cancer patients, not taking 12 biopsies, taking the patient to the OR and doing a robotic prostatectomy or external beam radiation. So I'm going to show you a little bit about this, and you're going to get to see this in the workshop. So this is the phantom I just show you. Uh, we've done the image um, contouring of the prostate, the urethra, and the region of interest and the rectum. There's a 3D image of that phantom. This is the program that's put out by Varian. It's called VariPath. It's very similar to the brachytherapy program, but they built it so you can actually put in the needles like this, and you can do the representations, and again, you'll see that this afternoon. So this is a paper we submitted to the uh, AUA based on this quadrant approach. And what we found, this is uh, data that came out of Dr. Scuteris Center in Greece, um, there were 83, of the 118 patients that we analyzed, uh, there were 83 that had clinically significant disease. And you can see um, that 30 of the 118 were limited to just one quadrant, 36 were limited to two. So that's a little slightly more than half the patients had one or two quadrants positive. So then the next question is where are these quadrants? So again, I put the prostate into four quadrants. So if you look at one lesion, no cancers were found in the right anterior of the gland. One cancer was found as a one lesion, or I should say one quadrant, in the left anterior. Four were found in the right posterior, and nine were found in the left posterior. So that's 14 or 36 percent of the patients who had clinically significant disease had cancer located just one quadrant, which means you could do one quadrant ablation and have confidence that there's no cancer in any place else based on a mapping biopsy. What about two lesions? So if you're looking at two lesions, 
five patients, or 12.8%, had just two lesions, no place else, that occupied the anterior gland. Now, the 12.8%, you can ask this question to Scott Lucia, is very similar to the radical prostatectomy data. It turns out that about 12 to 15% of the patients will have lesions just located in the anterior of the gland. When you look at the posterior, it was 23% were in the right and left posterior. Well, of course, that makes a lot of sense because we know prostate cancer is a posterior, mostly in the posterior of the gland. But what this tells us is that a, roughly a quarter of the patients, you would be ablating both the right and left posterior lobe. Only 10% were a hemiablation potentially on the right side of the prostate and 15% on the left side. So 25% of the patients could either have a left or right heavy ablation. And what's, it's not common, but there were still, one patient had a left anterior and right posterior lesion only, and two patients had a right anterior and left posterior lesions only. So it happens, but not, not commonly. So 27, or 69.2% had lesions located to two quadrants. So if you add that all up, remember what I said earlier, where is the cancer not? It turns out 80% of the patients, 85% of the patients have less than one quadrant. You could spare more than one quadrant. So conclusion, treating a single quadrant as identified by mapping, as identified by uh, MRI or using hemiablation plan left or right prostate may leave unidentified, unidentified clinically significant prostate cancer. <clears throat> Partial gland ablation should most commonly occur in both posterior quadrants, followed by the right or left posterior, and then a hemiablation. So that's the order. For focal therapy, a transperineal mapping approach, which can be done under local, should be considered the way to go if you want to uh, consider treating your patients with less than whole gland therapy. Thank you.